This video is presented to you by Physics for Students. To know more, please visit us at physicsforstudents.com. The objective of this particular series of video is to explain the Maxwell's equations in the easiest possible form. Welcome to my channel Physics for Students. My name is Shonak and I welcome you to this new series of videos on Maxwell's equations. Now before we go ahead and explain the Maxwell's equations, if you have seen my earlier video uh, on the development of thought of Maxwell's equations, you must have seen that originally Maxwell's equations were written in 20 different equations, 20 different forms, which I have shown in the previous video. If you want, you can just click on the description. I have given the link to watch the previous video which along with Oliver Heaviside was reduced to eight equations which we see in four different uh, forms. So what we do is that from eight equations once we reduce it to eight, uh, 20 to eight equations. So we see one the Gauss's field, uh, law for electric fields which has a differential integral form. We further see there is a Gauss's law of mag magnetic fields which again has these two forms. We see Faraday's law which has an integral and differential form and the ampere Maxwell's law which both has uh, integral and differential form. So four different uh, I would say concepts each of them having a differential as well as an integral form makes a total of eight different equations and yeah so eight equations that is the main study of our uh, you know series in this lecture video that how do we understand both the integral and differential form first what we understand is that those 20 equations which was originally written by Maxwell later improvised by Oliver Heaviside into eight equations and we are studying them into four each of them has got a differential and integral form now before we go ahead a very fundamental question which arises in any learner's mind is that why there is a differential as well as an integral form. I mean to say why each equation will have a differential as well as an uh, you know integral form. Now what I would like to tell you is that as you know that uh, both the differential and integral form are basically this way and this way they are basically speaking of the same concept right so when we move from differential to integral we can do again integral to make it down to differential form so what we can say these are different ways of expressing the same relationships right so from differential form what we do is that we in the differential form we express uh, every po point in space using derivatives. So what I'm trying to tell you is that Maxwell's equations in their differential form hold at every point in space time and are formulated using derivatives. So I mean to say they are local right in order to know what is going on at a point you only need to know what is going on near that point. Whereas the integral form I would say uh, primarily con uh, co consists of curve and curve surfaces and volume all those things. So in one way what we can tell is that the differential and integral form represents the same relationship only the differential form is something which is uh, located uh, related to uh, space uh, every point in space which is a different which is very local and for the curvature and volumes we take the integral form. Now it is something like expressing the a square plus b square equal c square into this and also uh, the logarithm in this way. So I can, we can, you can tell of integral form is comprises of macroscopic problems. So Maxwell's equation in their integral form are actually formulated in terms of integrals. So you know we need to have a curved surface volume to integrate over. Mathematically the differential and integral form are equivalent and we have seen that mathematically we can prove by applying the divergence theorem of Kelvin Stokes theorem. So differential form is something which is strictly local, integral form uh, describing of curvature, surface and volume 
is something which is on a macroscopic problem right there on the top left hand side of your screen i've just given simple examples where we in order to uh, express the exponential we use a logarithm and using the square formula we use a quadratic equation so more or less it speaks of the same so here on the right hand side i've expressed the differential and integral forms are equivalent and they can be again reproved by using the divergence theorem of green's theorem and stokes theorem so first of all this concept gets clear that why do we have uh, both the differential and integral form of Maxwell's equation rather right now the Gauss's law and that actually expresses that it is the same thing one speaking of the local far part and another the macroscopic problem okay so we are good to go at the first time now what we are going to also look into is the integral form of Gauss's law of electric fields so first we are dealing with the integral form of Gauss's law of electric fields so what we do before going into this i would like to explain to you two very important concepts in maxwell's equation one is called the electrostatic field and the same thing so electrostatic fields are due to static charges uh, separated in space and secondly what is called an induced electric field now what i'm trying to tell you is that when two objects in, in each other's vicinity have different electrical charges an electrostatic field exists between them an electrostatic field also forms around any single object that is electrically charged with respect to its environment now an object is negatively charged if it is an excess of electrons relative to its surroundings and an object is positively charged if it is deficient in uh, electrons with respect to its surroundings so induced electric field is what we say is non-conservative which means it has it is general by changing magnetic fields here are some important points the electrostatic field have elect different electrical charges they're electrically charged and they have some similarity in terms of the magnetic field so this is important because Gauss's law deals with electrostatic fields induced electric field is another important concept so I just thought to give you an idea of what is an electrostatic field and what is an induced electric field So now before we go ahead and see, you will see that there are different forms over internet, textbooks, etc. When we speak about Gauss's law, you will see this form, you will see this form, you will see this form, and you will see this form. So all of them are right. I am saying that all of them are good, all of them are fine. Different textbooks, different authors have different notations. However, we will deal with this form. So don't worry about this cumbersome kind of an equation which is right on your screen on the right hand side enclosed with a red box we are going to go ahead and explain each and every part in a very easy fashion with usage of less amount of mathematics so first this is what we call is the form form or the equation so first what we would do is that this part or the uh, i would say the left hand part of the equation is basically speaking of the electric flux right so the left hand side this part which is colored in blue is the electric flux so what we can say that which we are going to deal later for the timing let us think that uh, we can think of the number of electric field lines which are passing through a closed surface s or whatever whereas the right hand side this one is the amount of total charge okay contained within that surface divided by a constant which is called the permittivity of free space don't worry about these terms we are all going to take one by one step by step and we are going to deal with this now we, uh, we, which is, this actually means that if you have a closed surface now uh, let us go forward and I will tell you that because it's a closed surface and we will tell you in this series what exactly co closed surface is in detail of any size and shape and there is no charge inside the surface the electric flux that means the lines of electric lines which are going through the surface must be zero so if we are to place some positive charge anywhere inside the surface the electric flux through the surface would be positive if you add an equal amount of negative charge inside the surface uh, making the enclosed charge zero so the flux would again be zero so this is the overall meaning don't worry about those terms we will explain further the electric flux and the total amount of charge 
So what we are going to do is that we are going to take this term and let us explain the components part by part. So overall, this means that the electric charge, meaning of this Gauss's law of electric field means the electric charge produces an electric field and the flux of the field passing through any closed surface is proportional to the total charge contained within that surface. Now, this is quite a mouthful one. You understand in order to reproduce this, we use those equation, all those things so that it becomes easy. So this is overall, if you tell in literary term, it is the meaning of this Gauss's law for electric fields. Okay, so we take a kind of a box. Uh, this is the concept of electric flux. So we take a block and there are no charge in it. Then we take something, we position Q, which is uh, you, we are using the Coulomb's notation plus and the, there's a positive electric charge. And we will find out what is electric flux and why these lines are going out step by step. Then we take something, a negative charge, and you see there are certain lines which are going inside the box, which is the negative flux, and those which are going outwards in a radial direction, there's the pos uh, positive charge. And here we have taken electric flux through an arbitrary surface. It is proportional to the total charge enclosed by the surface. Don't worry about the terminologies. What is dA and what is the arrow on that? We are going to take uh, one by one everything through that. So this is basically a concept of no charge positive, positive and negative and electric charge through an arbitrary surface is proportional to the total charge which is enclosed by the surface. So these lines going out and in all those terms will be explained. Now let us take and understand the components of Gauss's integral form. Now we are dealing with the integral form in the later part of the video. In the next video we will be dealing with the differential form. So first let us understand what is the integral form part by part. Don't worry if you don't understand, don't understand all those terminologies right at the first go. But just understand what are the meanings so that we can explain it further. Now this integral, this big S, this is called the sum up of the small portions of a closed surface. That means you have got a closed surface. We will explain to you what is a closed surface. But this is summing up little bit small parts, one, two, three, four, small cubes, small bricks. This is added up and it carries a big sign like this one, which is an integral sign and it means summing up the portions over a closed surface. Okay, E arrow, this is electric field and the arrow on the top reminds this is a vector quantity. This S actually, it is a surface integral, not a volume or a line integral, right? So this is basically the surface integral that we are talking about. Okay, this one, this uh, I would say circle around this integral sign, uh, signifies this is an integral over a closed surface. Now it is important to understand what is a closed surface in Gauss's law because closed and open there are two types of surface we are going to take it over. For the time being let us understand this Gauss's law operate primarily on the closed surface which is uh, denoted by this circle which is right at the middle of this integral sign. This is the dot product, this small dot which is we find E is parallel to N. Don't worry we will deal on that. This part uh, with a hat on the top, it is unit, uh, uh, you know, normal vector to the surface that it is made parallel. Okay, so this is dA is an increment in the surface area. We will also look into this. Then we have got something with an epsilon naught. This is called permittivity of free space. And then we have got only the enclosed chart, which is denoted by ENC. And this is the Q, which is a classical notation of charge in coulombs so uh, this is more or less what is called the different components of Gauss's integral form I've explained you part by part what those means and the rest part of the video we will be concentrating more through different examples in order to in order to understand all the components of Gauss's integral form okay so what does Gauss's law actually helps in what does Galton's law helps in? So first what it does, it finds the electric flux through a surface. So given an information about the distribution of electric charge, we can find the electric flux through a surface enclosing that charge. 
Secondly, what it does is that it finds the total electric charge enclosed by the surface. Again, given certain information about the electric flux through a closed surface, we can find the total electric charge enclosed by that surface, right? So the best thing about Gauss's law is that for certain highly symmetric distribution of charge, which, are, which is very symmetric, you know, which is not very non-symmetric, I would say certain very highly symmetric distribution of charges, we can use this to find out the electric field itself rather than just the electric flux over a surface. So given a distribution, symmetric distribution of charges, which we will look forward, we can find out the electric field itself, not only the electric flux over the surface. So this is by far what you call at overall what Gauss's law helps in. Now before we go ahead, let us look into this question. Now, why is there a dot product in the Gauss's law? I mean to say, why is not there a cross product? What is the problem if we would have uh, taken a kind of a, a dot product? Now, in order to understand that, first of all, what we need to understand is what is called an electric flux. And we're going to take a very easy rudimentary approach to that. Now, if you see that uh, this, is, this is basically a kind of a definition. So flux actually means flow, okay, or act of flowing. Now, if it is related to electric field, it is called electric flux. And if it's related to magnetic field, it's called magnetic flux. So let us consider a water pipe section, right, right on the screen. So let us consider this to be a water pipe section. How do we tell if there is a tap in the section without looking at it? Right. Without looking at it, how can we tell there is a tap? Now, if we measure the flow in and out of the section, if there is no tap, obviously in the pipe section under consideration, whatever water comes in, it will go out. That means the red line, which is from the left hand side, which is coming in, it is going out. Assuming that there is no tap, right? But if there is a tap, then there is a net flow of water, right? So same analogy is applied to electric flux, meaning electric flow instead out of water flow. So you can just substitute the electric flow in place of water flow. Now, so you see that this water or the uh, electric lines or whatever you call this one is coming and there is an angle which is formed that is a, a cos theta angle. A is the electric field which is coming. E is the electric current which is coming. Now, you see what happens is that a dot product, as we all know, is an operation that takes two vectors as an input and what it returns a scalar number. So the dot product gives you exactly this one. As you see, it takes two vectors e and n right and their dot products give the result as you see on the right hand side of your screen so now what we say that projection of vectors i hope you understand this is a projection of e on n right the projection of e on n and i hope you all understand what is meant by projection if you have done in the high schools etc so uh, the uh, the we say the pro the projection of vectors uh, the basic concept of dot product it will take it will be much clearer now so however it since n equals to 1 that means it's a unique vector this is equivalent of taking the dot product so now you see that this is uh, what we call the electric flux right on the top which is written this one phi e equals to a dot e and equals to a cos theta so the electric flux is give, basically given by this dot product and this one which i circle this one this is the electric field and because this n is an unit vector so we can omit n and it comes to one right so this is the beauty now coming and going forward with this, what we see is that, so this is the dot product, right? Which you form, uh, which you see. Now, one important thing, let me go back here and let me tell you, you see that E is parallel to N. The, this one, this line which forms the cos theta, it is parallel. So let us see further. Now, this is the dot product you find, right? Now, this is the electric field, again, reminding that of a vector quantity. This is unit normal vector to the surface, which is N given with a hat sign. So you see this one, uh, right. So I am now taking, yeah, so you can see that these are two, you know, uh, what I would say, these are the two uh, uh, vectors A and E, right? And we can, uh, we can find out the cos theta part. So actually you will see if you go back to the basics, there are two vectors a dot product. Now it, there is algebraic way of producing dot product There's a geometric way. So we have taken the geometrically. It is a product of two vectors, the Euclidean magnitudes and the cosine of the angle between them. 
So the scalar product, you, as you see, of two vectors a and b, which is marked by bar, is given by a b cos theta, where theta represents the angle between the vectors a and b, and taken in the direction of the vector. So we can express the scalar product as this. So I just went back to understand what is a dot product and why in Gauss's law we are using the dot product because they, it is taking two vectors to a and e, right? the uh, a part which is coming as the area and the e which is the electric field and it is giving back the dot pro uh, begin giving back the scalar and that is why we use the dot product so coming to the back to the question why do we use dot product this is the reason that we use dot product because a dot product is an operation taking two vectors as input and producing a scalar and exactly Gauss's law does that it takes two vectors and produces a scalar as uh, as in case of this Okay, so we come back to the summary of this video. What we have seen is that why there is a differential as well as an integral form. We have seen that. We have also seen electrostatic and induced electric field. What are the different components? Each and every components we have seen, seen of the Gauss's integral form. And most important, why there is a dot product in Gauss's integral form. So, so most important of all those concepts is that why do we have a differential and integral two different forms and why there is a dot product in a Gauss's integral form. So that's it. So that covers the first part of the video. So I've given you a summary. And in the next video, we are going to cover what is called an electric field and further on. So do let me know your comments and your views and opinions in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe and like and do let me know how do you feel about this new series going on. Thank you very much for watching this video. Stay safe and stay happy and have a nice day ahead. Bye.